All right, so today I want to show you how to identify some genes in ball pythons by looking at the belly of the ball python. You can actually flip the snake over and based on the pattern of the belly, you can actually figure out which genes are in there. And with a really keen eye, you can actually pick out more than one gene in some cases based on the pattern on the belly. And when it comes to belly patterns, I say it's not really 100%. Sometimes it's really obvious. And in other cases, it takes a really keen eye to really figure out what genes are actually in there. And in some cases, you actually can't hardly tell at all if it actually has that gene in there. Sometimes there's a lot of debate. As a matter of fact, I've actually seen some normals that look like you kind of have a scrambled up pattern on the belly and you think there's some gene in there. And come to find out, it's just a normal ball python with a really interesting belly pattern. But I'd say in some cases, it's really obvious. And you can definitely tell which genes are in that ball python. So I want to jump over to the internet and I want to show you some of these interesting genes that leave characteristic patterns on the bellies of ball pythons. All right, so I want to jump over here on morphmarket.com and I want to start with pretty much the number one most popular gene that makes belly patterns on ball pythons. You may have heard of it and that is the het pied. And before I actually show you what a het pied is, I wanted to show you what a pied looks like. This is what a pied looks like. The pied is a recessive mutation, so you need two copies of the pied for a visual. And essentially what the pied does is it brings these big patches of white on the ball python. So if you actually took a pied and you bred it to a normal, all the offspring would come out is het pie. They'd all have one copy of the pie gene. And when it comes to recessive mutations in ball pythons, essentially the definition of recessive is that if you actually have one copy of the gene, you really can't see any indicator that you have one copy of the gene. So when it comes to the het pied markers on your ball python offspring after breeding this to a normal, essentially what you get is you get a small percentage of ball pythons that'll actually have markers on the belly. And if you actually had all the offspring having het pied markers, technically it wouldn't be a recessive mutation. It would actually be a co-dominant if you can actually see one copy of the, the pied gene in your offspring. So I actually wanted to show you what the het pied markers look like. You may have seen these before. This is pretty much the most common. A lot of people actually, they'll flip over the snake and they'll see these lines on either side of the belly. And that's a real strong indication that you have het pied in the mix. And usually I've actually seen quite a few variations of the head pied. I've actually seen they pretty much start right at the vent and a lot of times when I produce head pieds in my collection they'll come up about one third of the way up the ball python and kind of fade out into kind of a normal pattern on the ball pythons. As a matter of fact this one comes up pretty far quite a bit further than I've actually seen in a lot of other ones and where it gets a little bit tricky is sometimes you can have just one little splotch like right here you'll have like a normal pattern on the belly and the sides and then you just have like one or two little spots and you're kind of scratching your head thinking, all right, is that a head pied marker or is it just kind of a random spot on my normal ball python? And I'd say if you actually have really strong markers like this, you can be pretty confident that this is 100% head pied. I actually pulled up a couple more examples here and take a look at this one. This is the craziest one I've actually ever seen over here on Morph Market. And look at how strong these head pied markers are. As a matter of fact, this is actually the tail over here. Usually it kind of fades out after the tail and this one comes all the way up the belly almost all the way up to the head that is the craziest head pie that I've actually seen I actually pulled up one more over here and this this picture right here this is pretty typical of what I see in my collection almost all my head pies look exactly like this where it starts at the tail and it almost looks like someone took a sharpie marker and drew lines on either side of the tail and usually like right where the finger is here where he's holding the ball python it pretty much disappears into a regular pattern as far as the head pods that I produced here in my collection. So here's another one that's really confusing if you actually look at the belly pattern, and that is the orange dream. So the orange dream markers on the belly can look almost exactly like the head pies. And in some cases, it's almost impossible to tell the difference between the orange dream and the head pies. You can actually look at this one, and right by the tail, you can see these really strong markers right on the belly of the snake. And it seems like in a lot of cases, I've actually seen orange dream markers come almost all the way up the belly, almost you know completely up the snake. 
in a lot more cases versus the head pods. And it seems like the Orange Dreams will actually be more prevalent, where a lot more Orange Dreams will actually have the markers versus the head pods, which are probably, I'd say as far as the head pods, it's probably only about 10 or 15% of your head pods that actually have the markers. And it seems like most of the Orange Dreams actually have these really strong markers. I actually pulled up a couple more Orange Dreams, so you can definitely see they look almost exactly like the head pod markers. It's pretty amazing. You can be really confused, especially if you're working you know, pied into your orange dreams and you see these markers thinking you might have the hat pied in your orange dream. I actually pulled one more up here and this is kind of a kind of an unusual example of an orange dream. I've actually never seen one like this and look at the pattern on the belly. It's actually a pattern in the middle of the belly which makes me almost think there might be another gene in the mix in this orange dream to actually move the pattern to the middle of the belly which is pretty interesting. And another thing that's kind of confusing about the Orange Dream is if you actually look at the pattern on this one, it's really reduced into almost bands on the ball python. And that looks exactly like an Anchi. So in a lot of these Orange Dreams, you can actually pick them up and you, you look at them and you're thinking, all right, I think there's Orange Dream and Anchi. And you look at the belly and you're thinking there's Het Pied in there. And come to find out it's just all from the Orange Dream gene making all these markers and reduced pattern on the ball python. It's kind of interesting. So here's one that is pretty complicated and that is the yellow belly. And when it comes to yellow belly, a lot of people say, hey, you can tell you have a yellow belly by flipping over the snake and looking at the belly. And I'd say in most cases on a yellow belly, the belly is not actually yellow. So a lot of times you don't really wanna look at the color of the belly, but you can tell you have a yellow belly usually by looking at the sides. It almost looks like, I'd say almost is in the same position as the head pied markers, except it's really shattered and checkered. You have kind of this checkering pattern. Sometimes you'll actually see a little bit in the middle of the belly, but in most cases you'll actually have kind of a checkering right along either side of the belly. And when it comes to yellow bellies, it can be pretty confusing. Some normals look like you know, they kind of have some interesting pattern, almost like some of your yellow bellies. And in some cases, you can definitely tell them apart. So here's another yellow belly. Take a look at this one. This is pretty interesting. It has more checkering towards the middle of the belly, but you can definitely tell. As a matter of fact, if you actually look right by the tail, it almost looks like a het pied marker starting out down here, but it definitely has a lot more checkering and pixelation. You can definitely tell it's a yellow belly. In some cases, there's a little bit of overlap as far as trying to figure out what the genes are in this mix. As a matter of fact, this one's listed as a yellow belly or gravel. So this is where it gets a little bit complicated complicated because there's actually what we call a yellow belly complex which consists of five genes so there's the yellow belly the gravel the asphalt the spark and the specter and all those genes when you make combinations they make some completely different results when you mix them together but as a standalone gene they all look pretty much like normals maybe a little bit brighter than a normal but a lot of times if you actually look at the top of them they pretty much have a normal pattern if you flip them over they all look like pretty much the same. So for example, you can't tell the difference between a yellow belly or a gravel. And this is actually, this actually comes from a highway, which is an allelic combination of a yellow belly and a gravel. So you breed it to something and half the offspring come out as yellow belly, half come out as gravel, and you can't tell the difference, even looking at the belly. And you can definitely tell it's, it's a gene in the yellow belly complex by looking at the belly, but you don't know for sure which gene it is. It's one of the five genes which gets a little bit complicated when it comes to yellow belly. As a matter of fact, I actually pulled up one more here. Take a look at this one. This one's kind of interesting. It looks almost like the head pied markers may be a little more jumbled up. And sometimes it's really difficult to figure out you know, exactly what genes are in there. Sometimes you'll see a little bit and you're kind of scratching their head. All right, is this a normal ball python or is this yellow belly? And with a keen eye, you can definitely see that this has yellow belly in the mix. So here's another gene that actually has pattern on the belly, and that is the confusion. And the confusion's completely different than everything else. Essentially what it is, it, has, it usually has a pattern right in the middle of the belly. Sometimes it'll have this really strong line right down the middle of the belly. And essentially what confusion is, it's a dark gene. It's, it's, I'd say it's almost like a leopard on steroids. It really darkens the combinations and really shatters them, scrambles up the pattern even more than a leopard. 
leopard. And if you actually take a look at the confusion, uh, it's, it's almost like there's, there's three genes in the, I guess you could call it the confusion complex. There's actually three genes that we think may be exactly the same. And that is the confusion, the static, and the acid. I actually pulled up a static over here and take a look at this. It almost looks like the exact same belly pattern as the confusion. So some people say, you know, we actually discovered these genes almost kind of at the same time. We named them three different names, but in fact, a lot of people think that they're exactly the same. And I'm convinced that they are the same gene. If you actually look at the belly pattern as a standalone gene, and when you mix it in with combinations, it seems like in most cases you get similar results working with the static or the confusion or the acid. I actually pulled up another one over here. This is the acid. Uh, you can definitely see in this one, it definitely has lines right down the middle of the belly, which is kind of interesting. So this one's pretty interesting. I actually kind of stumbled into this one. This is actually an acid yellow belly with two genes that affect the belly of the snake, which is kind of interesting. As a matter of fact, if you actually look at the middle of the belly here, you can definitely tell from the line right down the middle that the acid is in the mix. And if you actually look at the kind of the sides over here, you can see the pixelation of the yellow belly. In this case, you can actually see both genes in the belly of the ball python, which is kind of crazy. So I actually wanted to pull up one more gene here at the end, and this is kind of a, this is one of the one of the things I've kind of heard rumors about, and I've never really found a really good picture of the belly pattern on a leopard. And I've actually heard kind of through the grapevine that a lot of your leopards will actually have some some belly patterns that are really similar to the confusion or the acid or the static. And sure enough, I actually found this picture over here at Morph Market. It took me a long time to figure out, you know, to actually find this picture over here. And sure enough, it actually has right down the middle of the belly, it has some belly patterns on the leopard, which is kind of interesting. So that is pretty interesting, all the different belly patterns you can see. And as far as all the other genes, I don't think you can really see any other belly patterns on any, any other genes except just these genes in ball pythons. All right, so what is time for the question of the day? And Ben McFarland asks, how do you feel about feeding hamsters to ball pythons instead of rats? And that is a very good question. As a matter of fact, I think I know where this question's coming from. I actually went over to one of the online retailers that sells frozen rodents, and they actually have a big sale on hamsters. You can actually get them for less than half the price of rats. You may actually be tempted to go over there and buy a bunch of hamsters to save some money. And let me tell you, with ball pythons, hamsters can be a little problematic because ball pythons absolutely love hamsters. They go crazy over them. And I would think if you actually fed hamsters over a long period of time, your ball python could get stuck on hamsters and it'll be difficult to transition back to regular rats. And let me tell you, I've actually had some mousers here in my collection, ball pythons that will only eat mice. And if you feed a ball python mice year after year, you get to the point where that ball python will eat nothing but mice, which is, which is kind of problematic with mice because they don't really get that big. And a lot of times you have to feed a ball python a lot of mice to put some weight on them. So with hamsters, I say, you know, it may be good to buy a few hamsters, maybe as a treat once in a while to kind of get them off of a fast. You can kind of do that. I've actually done that with some African softwares, but as far as a long-term diet, I would probably avoid hamsters. So that is pretty much it. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.